Happy New Year to your listeners, and Happy New Year to my book friends Mark and Fiona. It is 2023. Ah,、uh, that should be exciting, and I do believe this is more like the most wonderful time of the year because this is when you have all your hopes and dreams, and they're all alive and well. Because <laughs> it's still only like a few days into the new year, and of course, for us book lovers, that means another. Avalanche of new books coming our way、um, that we are excited to read and looking forward to. So this is the episode where we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the books that are coming out that we wanted to read.、Um, and so last week, Corinne and I did ours.、Um, you know, of course, murder was on the menu.、Um, you know, we have not just a murderer, but like a family of murderers.、Um, we also have a woman who, for some reason, people come to her to get. Advice on how to murder someone.、Uh, we had some golden age mystery translated from Japanese, of course, and of course we have to remind everybody just to a PSA. You know, never、um, accept an invitation to a remote island, to a remote ski resort, to a you know remote mansion, unless you have your own helicopter or you have at least two ways to get out of there. Um, I might have read my favorite book already, Twenty Twenty Three. Um, so every book from now on will be compared to that book. Um, and、uh, we agree on a awesome cover, um, by a Korean author. We talk about French elves. We talk about yes, <laughs> we talk about lungs and chicken soup. Um, we ask some questions like, what is in the suitcase, or what is that thing in the snow. And we, of course, concluded that a mushroom is never just a mushroom. So,、um, with that, I am very excited to listen to、uh, see what Mark and Fiona have for us today. I get to just sit here and listen and press some buttons. So I'm very. This is the best keep、uh, keep it fictional episode for me.、Um, so、uh, we will start. Why don't we start with Mark? Mark, what is a book that you are looking forward to this、uh, year? Okay, so the first book that I am looking forward to most this coming year is called "A、uh, Stravaging Strange" by Sigismund Kersakovsky.、Um, I've talked about him a couple times now, slightly, or he's been talked about on this podcast a couple of times. <clears throat> And in early 2023, there will be another new collection of recently translated works of his、uh, into English.、Um, There's going to be a collection of stories as well as short sayings and sort of like aphorisms and writings by Kirsnikovsky, as well as、uh, personal reflections written by his partner.、Um, so the the three stories in this collection have give little snippet previews of them. The title story, "Stravaging Strange," features a apprentice mage who, in his attempts to find ways to woo his Uh, would be lover. He decides to try and observe her more closely by drinking a magic potion to shrink himself down to a miniature size, so he can sort of、uh, operate undetected, more or less. And he begins to encounter many strange, strange creatures that normally go outside of human detection because of their little miniature size. This includes a talkative King of Hearts card, a gallant flea,、uh, a group of house nip- imps. As well as another shrunken down miniature human, who he's、uh, who is his rival in love, more or less.、Um, in the second story, catastrophe,、uh, he takes ideas and parodies the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, another theme of his from many of his other stories,、um, in which an old sage attempts to extract the essence from all things、um, and attempt to understand reality. But after extracting the purified essence of all things in the world,、uh, to the surprise of no one, chaos ensues. Um, and in the third story, material for a life of gorgeous Katafalaki,、um, set in the major capital cities across Europe, such as Berlin, Paris, London, and Moscow,、um, the title character Gorgeous Katafalaki recounts his own absurd life across the continent、uh, as he sort of lives an unfixed、uh, address and profession through his sort of curiosity and imagination carries him across the continent、um, in place of his more material wealth. Um, among the aphorisms, there are many just like little short sayings. One that's sort of provided by the publisher in the preview is 
I'm not on good terms with the present day, but posterity loves me, which almost sounds like it could have been written on uh, Kirtakovsky's epitaph or some sort of thing, because he's almost predicting his own life where he's unpublishable under Stalinist Russia, but essentially later on, as he's sort of gained more notoriety uh, in recent decades through translation and other rediscovered works of his that weren't really known or were just considered completely unpublishable by uh, Russian publishers at the time. So if you're at all curious what goes on uh, with this guy, because his partner, Anna Bovshek, also kept like uh, some intimate, more personal reflections on Kirsnikovsky as a person, their day-to-day -day lives together and things like that. So you also get to a bit of a look at him as a person um, outside of his sort of more um, rarefied kind of aura as this strange writer who writes these um, bizarre stories that many people kind of scratch their heads at. Uh, so if you ever were interested in any of his stories or wanted to know maybe a little bit more about him, then I think this uh, Stravaging Strange will also be appealing to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing your part in making that aphorism come true um, again. Uh, so that's great. Fiona, do you have a favorite author to recommend us? I absolutely do. I'm just a little bit behind because I'm trying to add Mark's book to my TBR. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to start you off with a sequel uh, so that you have time to go back and read the uh, first book before the second book comes out. Uh, it is a Lee Bardugo uh, adult foray, Hellbent, the sequel to the seventh house which you may recall i talked about in a recent episode um the ninth house pardon me that that sounds a little more familiar uh yeah so i was i i'm pretty sure i read it for our dark academia episode and so i just pulled it out of nowhere and was so pleasantly surprised and am super looking forward to the sequel uh in the ninth house alex uh galaxy stern uh, is a freshman and she has been able to see ghosts her whole life and it's sort of ruined her life however that's about to turn around when she is recruited to Lethe, uh, the body tasked with monitoring Yale's secret societies so with that she's thrown into the whole Ivy League um, school thing uh, as well as a world of dark magic it was a fun um, mystery uh, and with that sort of new adult um, tone to it so it has a lot of the kind of like wish fulfillment of YA that's quite pleasing uh, with a little bit of a darker tone. In this second book, um, Alex has to break Darlington, her mentor, out of hell. Uh, and so, you know, she has been warned by the, uh, the uppers of Lethe, absolutely under no circumstances, to go into hell to get Darlington back, but she has assembled a team of people who are committed to this cause, and uh, they are going to go for it. So um, I'm super excited. We're going to get a little bit more of the secondary characters who are all uh, very pleasing. Um, in particular, I'm blanking on her name, but uh, the like sort of um, archivist for Lethe, uh, I think, is going to play a big role in it, and I really loved her. Um, and in, as far as romances go, um, Alex and Darlington are not the worst. So, you know, I even kind of hope for a happy ending in which they maybe pulled Darlington out of hell so they can finally be together. Um, that is Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. If you're not, if you haven't read The Ninth House yet, I highly recommend getting on that for all of you uh, dark academia folks out there uh, and you new adult readers. Uh, this is definitely one that you're going to want to get on top of. Thank you, Fiona. I'm always a little concerned about sequels because you never know what they're like, especially when the first one is so good. But I, I'm pretty sure Lee Bardugo can pulled it off because they have done many many different series before they know what they're doing so yeah so that's great um mark what have you got next so my second book is going to be a sort of an autobiography slash conversation of sorts called uh miss major speaks the life of a black trans revolutionary um and in this book the legendary transgender elder and activist uh miss major griffin gracie is in conversation with her longtime friend and assistant Toshio Marinek. Um, so to give a bit of a background on who Miss 
major is. She's a, been around since the infamous Stonewall riots, a former se sex worker and transgender elder and activist um, who survived many run-ins with like the psychiatric establishment, the law, um, and others. She survived the HIV AIDS crisis and a world built by white supremacy. Um, in this book, essentially, it's kind of like a conversation between herself and Marinek. So essentially, rather than taking the traditional form of an autobiography, where it sort of goes like the childhood and like young adult, adult, kind of like in that kind of chronological manner, it's structured much more around kind of themes and topics that um, they find both find uh, important or interesting. And then uh, Miss Major sort of reflects on how she sort of come to be where she is today based on these past experiences and um, her present life, as well as how her sort of hopes for the future, how future activism could be taking shape um, as it goes. And this sort of um, being a Black trans woman, this very much also relates to things that have been talked about a lot around things like Black Lives Matter, the history of white supremacy in the United States, as well as trans exclusionary feminism, trans exclusion and um, uh, gay and lesbian liberation and things like that. So you definitely get a very, um, a very unique perspective of hers as she is definitely also if you read some of the previews of the book you can tell that she also talks very much without a filter or very little filter so she very much makes her opinions on things known she doesn't try to beat around the bush or sort of be like ultra polite about some of the, her opinions on things and her past experiences so you very much get like a intimate and close-up of look at what her opinion on things are whereas in a more traditional autobiography you might get like a bit more uh like kind of I don't want to say dressed up, but sort of like uh, it, it's a different experience when you're sort of like arranging things in that kind of matter versus this sort of conversational format. It kind of gives rise to things that might not necessarily be planned that she wanted to say, but just it sort of arises naturally from their sort of uh, discussions about the past, the present, and the future. So um, I think she definitely brings a unique perspective, and it's important to know these sort of past, uh, hear from past voices to in order to know like how the passes shape the future or the present and the future um so i definitely would recommend this book i think it'll be very good and very uh illuminating for anyone who's interested in knowing more about lgbtq history as well as uh black lives matter and other related uh activist organizations so i definitely would recommend uh miss major speaks and is one of my most anticipated nonfiction books of the year for sure Thank you, Mark. Um, I don't like memoir, but that sounds a lot more interesting. Like when it sort of like format as a as a as a kind of conversation that I can deal with. And I'm just gonna give Fiona some time to write that, put that on their reading list too. I'm pretty sure that is going on yours. <laughs> that sounds also like right up your alley. Um, so Fiona, give you a ready. What is your second uh, anticipated read? Yes, I am definitely just writing down all of Mark's picks. Um, but my second pick is actually um, a mystery. And I have two mysteries on my list, which I know is, un is uncommon for me. Like I will read a mystery, but it's definitely not where I gravitate towards. And I think it's like if the if the content is there, you know, I don't read it for the mystery. I read it for the subject matter. And this one is right up my alley. And I have Virginia to thank for pointing this book out to me. It is Scorched Grace by Margot uh, Duahai. Um, of course, we have a sleuthing nun, but she is not just any nun. She is a chain smoking, heavily tattooed queer nun. Oh, be still my heart. Um, so this is Sister Holiday. Um, and the uh mystery revolves around a series of arsons at St. Sebastian's School. Um where the Sisters of the Sublime Blood um, are, re reside, uh, and uh, Sister Holiday is a member there, uh, and she is completely unsatisfied with the um, police's response to this series of arsons. So naturally, she decides to take this on um, on her own. Uh, the Apparently, the mystery is very high stakes, and uh, it ends up turning uh, many of uh, the sisters against Sister Holiday. So it sounds like it's going to be a bit of an intense mystery, but of course I am going to be reading it for Sister Holiday herself. I cannot wait to read about this sort of, um, this, this 
type of hard hard living nun. Uh, I think it is going to be a great approach. Um, I love to see the, the tension between um, people's different uh, approaches to faith. That's I don't know why. It's just something that I like to read about, the sort of debate between, and it sounds like uh, Sister Margot, or pardon me, Sister Holiday has a, a very specific approach. So cannot wait to read this one. Um, I do think that it's probably going to be a bit of trouble to find on audiobook, but I, I please say that they are making this on audiobook. I will have to wait until then. That is Scorched Grace by Margot, D-O-U-A-I-H-Y. Thank you, Fiona. I'm pretty sure that book is written for you. Um, and there seems to be a lot more kind of, I don't know, maybe it's just because you have like drawn out attention to books about nuns and monks. I just keep seeing them everywhere. So yeah. That is great. Well, thank you. And Mark, what's next? Uh, my third anticipated book is The Wounded Age and Eastern Tales by Ferlit Aju. Aju. I I know I'm saying that name wrong. I've never heard his name said out loud, so I apologize for saying it so horribly. Um, this is a combination of two short novellas uh, written by the critically acclaimed Turkish writer Ferlit Aju. Um, who is now 86, but this is actually the first time his works have been translated to English. Um, and even though he's been very critically acclaimed, he's won a number of uh, important literary awards in Turkey. Um, this is just sort of like the beginning of his translation into English. So hopefully this will be the first of many collections of his works that make its way into English. In the first story of the Wounded Age, it features a newspaper reporter signed to write about a uh, uh, ongoing ethno-national violence in the mountainous region of eastern Turkey. Um, he's a stranger to this region. Um, he has no idea about the language or like the different uh, things going on in this area. But what he does know is that he can't go about sort of trusting and understand without understanding what's going on in this region. Um, all he knows is that for too long, people have sort of closed their eyes to the realities of what's happening in this region of the country. Um, a reality is that he thinks that he can't look away from any longer. He has to face up to their truth. Um, and in order to determine this truth, he has to go there to hear the stories of the war, violence, and camps of displaced people to record the truth and to sort of reveal their lives to the, the country and his readership at large. In the second part of the collection, Eastern Tales, um, it's much more brief sort of short stories and snapshots of lives of people in a, another different remote mountainous village in the eastern part of Turkey. This it's sort of like a theme of this collection, whether it's sort of put the two are put together as they both take place in this uh, sort of mountainous region of eastern Turkey. Um, he paints a picture of the region's traditions, customs, and values. Um, and these some of these tales, what I understand, can be very short, maybe just one or two pages. Some of them are a little bit longer, like 10 to 12 pages, it's kind of a little bit more narrative driven, whereas some of the shorter ones are a bit more like a snapshot of a person's life or uh, various aspects of life in this area of Turkey. Um, another kind of uh, part that may appeal to some was to others, there's very few names given. There's very sparse kind of prose uh, in in these stories. Uh, apparently, Ju is very known for having very brief kind of to the point kind of language. He doesn't like to go on long elaborations or ramblings about different things. So if you're interested in something that's a little bit more to the point, kind of short and sweet, that's sort of like one of his specializations from what I understand. Um, and having these two books paired together, I think it's kind of like maybe an interesting introduction to this person's work, because as I said, he hasn't been translated to English before. So just try and get these kind of like different looks at some of his different writings and the different forms and lengths, I think will also be uh, a good introduction to him. So that's why I am looking forward to The Wounded Age and Eastern Tales. Thank you, Mark. Um, and that's also published by like your one of your favorite publishers, right? New York Review Books. Yeah, they have a very like distinct look for all their covers. So that's great. And I, I can see that they're always doing like really interesting authors, like stories from all around the world. So that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for being- That's also how I discovered Kirsten Akofsky is they release a number of his works in yeah. that line. And there's a number of my other favorite writers that have I've discovered through this line of books. And they always have that distinct kind of square yeah. on the cover with like yeah. specific yeah. colors and specific yes. fonts that uh, is very distinctive if you're looking across the shelf you can always spot them when you're looking for them and that's 
it's almost like a penguin classics kind of thing but much more modern in a way kind of it's more 20th century whereas a penguin classic sort of goes all the way across the history of literature basically yeah. yeah yeah and i like that they always have like it's almost always authors that i've never heard of um you know from other countries that's great like i love that well thank you um and then fiona do you have another mystery or we don't want to talk about the other mystery Yes, I am going to talk to you about my second mystery on the my picks, my most anticipated. Um, this one I am drawn to um, because it features a group of guerrilla gardeners. <laughs> this is Burnham Wood I, by Eleanor Catton. Um, she won the Booker Prize. I think she was the youngest winner of the Booker Prize for the Luminaries, which I have not read. But if this turns out good, then I'll go back. Um, uh, Burnham Wood is, like I said, a guerrilla um, group of gardeners. Uh, and they were formed by Mira five years ago. Uh, and they... Um, they basically add greenery uh, to places, um, some of which they're not allowed. So um, just going around um, and, you know, finding any spot basically um, in the same way of graffiti that uh, that there could be some planting um, and, and adding that, that greenery. And it's actually set in a small town in New Zealand um, on the South Island, which is uh, definitely going to be an interesting setting. Um, so to me, that's what's interesting. This idea of this group um, who who are uh, committed to to uh, planting, um, but they do that, you know, without any care for the law. However, um, the mystery itself uh, comes when a landslide uh, closes the pass to their town, and for whatever reason. Uh, that leaves a uh, sizable farm abandoned. So Mira decides this is the perfect place for Burnham Wood uh, to to plant. This can be their new spot. However, uh, it is also um, claimed by a an American billionaire who says it's a great place for his end of the world bunker. Now they seem to come to uh, kind of an agreement where um, basically the billionaire says, okay, I will, I will let you work this land. Uh, and then they kind of come entwined, um, their, their stories become entwined. Um, I have no idea what the sinister mystery is going to be. And that's quite exciting. I love going into something, knowing, uh, you know, I'm interested in this part of it, but I don't want to know about the mystery. I just want to see it fall out. Uh, she's a, a fantastic writer. Um, so I think it is is going to be uh, really worth the read and, and you know, maybe a little bit unique with, with this concept that it's coming at. So that is uh, Eleanor Catton's Burnham Wood. And I know Burnham Wood is drawn from the line in Hamlet. It's supposed to be um, the wood, I think, that... Sorry, not... Uh, yeah, Hamlet uh, is part of the prophecy. Um, so uh, very much looking forward to that. Thank you, Fiona. That might have been, like, one of my favorite premises for this, the books that are coming out this year, the gorilla got in the room. I'm like, yeah, I'm there for that. <laughs> that sounds so much fun. Um, Great. Well, so speaking of so much fun, well, let's uh, put aside our books for a little bit and let's uh, talk about our existential question for the day. So um, I would love to know, because it's the beginning of the year, the, the very kind of like standard question that you usually get asked is, what are, if you have any, um, and you may not have any, that's fine. Uh, what are your reading resolutions? Or do you have any like reading goals for 2023? Yeah, so I have my what for uh, reading resolutions, but I don't have the how yet. Uh, basically, I would like to read more books. <laughs> it's just, you know, I love reading and there's so many things out there that I want to read. And then it's trying to figure out how to fit more in. Because right now I read a book a week. And then on top of that, I read graphic novels. So I can like, I know I'm going to get 52 novels and then, you know, give or take 10 to 15 graphic novels. How can I up that? What can I do? What what other times can I find a slide in reading or listening? <sighs> 
give up sleep? I don't know. That's... <laughs> yeah, I think that might be the answer. What about you, Mark? Well, I think my biggest resolution is one of the issues I have is I try to read too many things simultaneously. So oftentimes I'll have like at least three or four things I'm reading back and forth between them. And I enjoy doing this, but at the same time, it can also be difficult to get through something that you want to keep going through. But then it's like, oh, I got these other things also going on that I want to get through too as well. So to try and um, maybe manage my uh, checkout time for things to not take out so many things at once. So that way I can um, prioritize a little bit more and focus a little bit more because sometimes I have a lot of trouble doing that sometimes it seems. Well, and it seems possible because we all work at a library. It's really hard, right? Because you see so much stuff every day. You have a chance to see more things that you haven't noticed yesterday. <laughs> There's always something more interesting. And it doesn't help that we go on this podcast because then like you're all talking about books and I'm like, oh, well, I want to read that too. And then it becomes this long, long giant list. But that's, but that's part of the fun, I guess. <laughs> I think maybe I have to start taking more of your approach, Virginia, of like, you know, if it's not good, don't finish it because uh -huh. there's so many good things out there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, because then like, you know, you are taking up like, you know, hours spent on a book that you did not enjoy, whereas there's like this perfectly like fun book sitting right next to it that you're not getting to. So, yes, definitely did not finish is the best thing that I have discovered. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get back into books that uh, we hope to get to read, you know, in uh, in soon. Um, so, Mark, what is your fourth most anticipated read? So, my number four is actually going to be a manga pick. Um, and it is March Comes in Like a Lion by Chika Umino. Um, and ever since this manga was adapted to an anime in 2016 to 2018, um, that didn't adapt all the series, unfortunately, because it's still ongoing. Uh, it's been on my radar waiting the day that it will finally be released in English. So then we can read the original version um, officially and get to it. And unfortunately, because this book was originally actually on my fall 2022 most anticipated list, but then it got delayed until next year. So I had to kick it off onto this time. But hopefully it actually is coming out in February this time so we can all enjoy it. And in March Comes Like a Lion, the story follows Kirayama Rei. A shogi prodigy from the time he was a young child, he has been talented at playing this traditional Japanese game of strategy that's uh, somewhat akin to chess or Go, these kinds of sort of tabletop games of moving pieces and back and forth turns involving strategy and tactics and all that kind of stuff. And while Ray's never struggled to succeed at shogi, his personal life has been another story. At a young age, the death of his biological family in a car crash to a tumultuous life with his adopted family. Um, Reyes decides to begin to live independently as a professional shogi player while still a teenager. In the process, he's also decided to quit high school, uh, finding little enjoyment being at school or with his peers. But this lack of connection to family and school has led to feelings of isol isolation and depression for Ray. But this gradually begins to change when he meets the Kawamoto family, three sisters living in a household headed by the eldest sister, Akari, who is raising her two younger sisters because their parents have either passed away or absent from their lives entirely. Uh, through his everyday and deepening connection with the Kawamoto's, Ray begins to experience the joys of found family. Um, Ray also begins to develop friendships with his fellow professional shogi players like the fiery and passionate Harunobu Nikaido and the kind and gentle Kai Shimada, both of whom have their own life complications that touch Ray on a deeper level. Um, Inspired by his improving social life, Ray even returns to high school, where he's mentored by perhaps the greatest high school teacher of all time, Takashi Hayashida, whose guidance and encouragement of Ray gives him a sense of welcomeness and enjoyment at school that he never imagined possible before. Um, through themes of family, both biological, adopted, and found, physical and mental health, determination to be the best you can at something, um, March comes in like a line to a very emotional and personally engaging series. Uh, and very realistic in a lot of ways as well. There's also a, a fair bit of humor along the way um, through the more slice of life kind of day-to-day -day aspects of this series, and uh, as well as the inner thoughts of the Kawamoto family's cats, from demands to more food to contented thoughts while lazing underneath a kotatsu. Um, uh, <laughs> this series 
definitely is also in the afraid of being very real about personal trauma and illness and struggles to live life within the character's daily day being, but does it in a very sort of sensitive and a, a personally connecting way, whereas you see the character's feelings and history each individually. Um, there's also a lot of in-depth sort of strategic and psychological thinking in the shogi segments of the story, as these parts were created with the advisory of an actual shogi professional to realistically portray the sort of tension and strategy that goes into a match, as you sort of see Ray and the other players in their matches with one another. So there's a lot of uh, interesting aspects to this story that um, felt very realistic and engaging throughout. So that's why I think you should also check out March Comes Like a, like a Lion when it finally debuts in English uh, this spring. Yes, and we will check that out because that sounds amazing. <laughs> I love I love the like I like manga because they there's just even like when you listen to the premise and you're like that sounds weird or that sounds like ridiculous but they always like just like you said it's always like so heartfelt there's always like really really engaging characters and and it's really not about like I don't know soccer or baseball or whatever it is it is or or, 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 or shogi in this way but like it is about those characters and it's they always manage to do that it's just the best anyway Fiona what have we got. Okay, so I am returning to one of my favorite literary tropes in this one, which is the uh, coming home story. Um, so life is going great for Audrey in New York. Uh, she is a workaholic in a high paying, high pressure job that she loves. And she has the perfect fiance, Ben. Before they get married, they think it's important for her them to go back to her little an Illinois town so that he can meet her Chinese American family. However, that is easier said than done. When they do return to Illinois, things don't go quite how Audrey expected. She comes face to face with her old life and all, all of the things that she left behind, um, including a high school crush who, uh, well, he might not be a match for new Audrey, was always the one who understood her uh, during high school, was the only one who really got uh, what was going on with her. Okay, so um, this sounds very character-driven, uh, and it's, yeah, just approaching so many of the things that I love to read about uh, and characters who are caught in the middle um, whether that's culture or just point of life um, this whole idea of our past selves uh, and whether we can really leave them behind or whether they're always there being pushed down um, yeah so uh, it sounds like a bit of a quiet book which as we know, it's also something that I love. Um, just and and uh, really about a character trying to figure out uh, what she wants. Uh, I also, you know, I I like <laughs> I like romance uh, when it's not the center. It's nice to have like a you know a thoughtful um, a character who's really thinking about their love life without it being a whole like. You know, it doesn't always have to be Bollywood dances. Uh, sometimes it can be a really serious deep dive into to what you want for your future love life. So uh, really looking for Central Places by Delia Cal. And uh, look at that two-toned cover. Isn't it beautiful? It is, uh, it's pink and yellow for those of you listening. Um, yeah, very, very stunning color combination. Central Places, check it out. Thank you, Fiona. And for another great character-driven pick, I think you do like romance. You said that like, you know, like in a couple episodes ago when we did the top, like the top five 2022, I think you secretly like romance, I think. <laughs> All right, Mark, our last pick of the day. Uh... All righty. My last pick for the Anticipated of 2023 is After Sappho by Shelby Wynne Schwartz. Um, this book was actually originally released in 2022 in the UK, but it did not get published in North America until 2023. So that's why it's on this list now. 
It was also long listed for the Booker Prize, I believe, last year. And that's probably contributed to why it's now being published in North America. Um, it's definitely getting a little bit more attention now, thanks to that um, shout out from the Bookers. Um, as that often tends to happen when a book doesn't get released in North America, they get listed for sort of like the Booker. There's going to be a lot more attention given to it. So I'm glad that it got shot. The spotlight got shined on this one this time. The book takes its name from the famous Greek poet Sappho and her lyric poems about uh, the lives of women and love between two women and these very other kind of aspects of romance among women that uh, were very out of step with the time being an ancient Greek uh, poet from something like 500, 600 BC. Um, so essentially in this book, uh, it reimagines the intertwined lives of different women uh, from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. Um, this includes, in 1892, Rina Fascio, the writer who began to write poems and autobiographical writings about women in late 19th century Italy, Romaine Brooks in 1902, a painter who became known for her paintings of women in more traditionally masculine kind of settings, poses and ways of presenting themselves, because within painting, there's essentially certain traditional kind of quote-unquote masculine and feminine kind of settings and themes and ways of presenting the characters that she very much did not ascribe to. And in 1923, the writer Virginia Woolf and her writings begin to inspire feminist activism and consciousness raising. Um, and these three women's lives are sort of told in different vignettes. Um, and though the narratives don't converge into one, like sort of like, and then these three people meet at in one place or anything like that, it's sort of meant to sort of, how should I put this? It's sort of like a cumulative kind of theme that emerges through the different vignettes. They can kind of see the relations between their lives, the kinds of ideas that they're working with, um, the issues that they're uh, struggling against with like sexism and homophobia and other things like that. Um, another aspect of the story that I found kind of interesting is that often, apparently in Schwartz's writing, she uses plural collective pronouns such as we and us in many of these narratives so to try and kind of give a more sense of unity among women and the different characters that are presented throughout these different time periods and different settings. Um, so I thought that was fairly interesting sounding as well. Um, and I also, because as I sort of mentioned in a previous episode this year on the historical fiction, I also enjoy these kinds of stories about historical people that aren't necessarily 100% things that happened to them, but sort of presented in a way that's believable and realistic that they could have been in that kind of situation or it draws on aspects of their actual lives and work to create a kind of um, narrative or story that is interesting and compelling. And I think that's definitely the case um, for what I've read about this book so far. So I'm definitely very much looking forward to after Sappho. Thank you, Mark. Um, and if you're looking for another, uh, like like Mark said, like a lot of the Booker Prize winners just don't get translated until like a year later, which is very, very annoying um, because the winner of the International Booker Prize from last year, Tom of Sand, is also not translated yet, but it's going to come out this season. So that's another one to put it on your TBR. Um, so Fiona, last book. What is the book that you're going to recommend us? Uh, so I'm going to finish off with a historical fiction um, about the legacy of slavery. This is River Sing Me Home by Eleanor Shearer, uh, and it takes place in Barbados in 1834, uh, right at the time of the Emancipation Act. So um, it starts out on a Providence plantation, and uh, the slave, slave owner um, announces that uh, tomorrow they will be emancipated. However, um, their excitement is quickly quelled when he he uh, lets them know that they will no longer be slaves, but they will now be apprentices. Um, and so uh, they must work for him for another six years. Um, and uh, their freedom is really... Uh, really more in word than in truth um so the story itself is about rachel um who who loses hope after this uh hope for a good future there and she runs um and 
It is about the search for her five children, Mary Grace, Micah, Thomas, Augustus, Cherry Jane, and Macy. Mercy, pardon me. Um, those are her five surviving children uh, who have all been sold off. And it is about her um, her journey to try to find them. She travels to French Guyana, to Trinidad, um, uh, and away from Barbados during that journey. So um, I'm very interested in the legacy of slavery and also that idea about, you know, like when we gloss things over in history, um, you know, we talk about emancipation. It's like, you know, that was the start of the end. Um, and, you know, of course, we recognize that in many ways slavery was just transformed um and and so seeing more of the reality of that of you know that things don't just happen immediately um and then understanding the 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 very personal or the very um you seeing from one character how how they were affected by that um i'm a little bit trepidatious because the the blurb um is very focused on the fact that she's a mother and you know doing what any mother would do and um i think there's i think there are a lot of stories to be told about uh the the way that slavery um broke up families um but i really hope that we get to see more from rachel than just her drive as a mother um and uh I really like the the kind of like plurality um, that it seems to be giving of like we're going to have these these different children, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll kind of get um, a few different a few different characters because I, I love to see those sort of parallel um, stories happening at once. Um, yeah, but this is one that I'm I almost didn't put on my on my list because I know it's going to be really difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really really glad that I decided to I can't wait to read it I already uh, actually have secured a, a uh, pre-release copy and I, I cannot wait so I'm sure I will be giving you more on this one soon uh, River Sing Me Home by Eleanor Sh Shearer Thank you, Fiona. Um, yeah, it does sound like a, a pretty devastating story but I think it's a well worth like you said, it's a worthy things for us to tackle definitely and thank you for all the writers who are willing to write about it and and give us that perspective um and yeah so it, it definitely takes a lot of courage so thank you um both to you and mark uh for introducing us to 10 amazing books you know i'm sure our listeners now have another long like list of tbr to add to um so that is really exciting um <laughs> All right, and of course, this Keep It Fictional most anticipated episode wouldn't be complete without Gabriel. So hello, Gabriel. Happy New Year. Happy oh. New Year. And uh, yeah, so we are looking forward to listening to what, to hearing what kind of books that you are looking forward to reading. But before we do that, um, there's a question that I ask everybody is... Do you have any reading resolutions or reading goals for 2023? Nope. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. And I will be happy with any reading I do, whether that is purely self-indulgent, whether that is um, maybe I branch out of my comfort zone. I think that the very high school forcing yourself to read something that you don't want to read has never been good for me. And so I will just take it as it comes. And if I, I feel like if I don't set as many resolutions, I will actually read more. So. That sounds good. Yeah. That was kind of some of ours. It's just like, we're just going to read whatever we want. We don't, we're not going to force ourselves to read certain things that are supposed to be, I don't know, whatever they're supposed to be, but yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, Yeah. So I, don't go too far from like, you know, the the usual genre. So because, you know, we're look we're counting on you to do those fantasy and science fiction picks. So which I'm hoping that there will be some today. Um, so yes, so the floor is all yours. Let us know what you are looking forward to reading. Uh so the first upcoming release I have for us is How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. So this is the author of the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires and the final girl support group. 
and also another book that I talked about on the podcast back, I think, when we were doing an episode on offices, which was Horror Store, which is um, sort of like haunted Ikea. Um, so the concept for this book is simple, how to sell a haunted house. But knowing Hendrix, I'm sure that he's going to put a very satisfying twist on it, because if you've read any of his other books, he has a very in-depth knowledge of horror tropes, but also a very strong um, I would say anyway, uh, like a mastery of comedy. And so in the sort of realm of horror comedy, I think that this is something that will be probably both um, very funny, but also one that will be maybe unexpectedly meaningful in some ways, because that was my experience reading some of his other books. And so if he keeps up with that, I think that it'll be quite fun. It's set to release mid-January, so you won't have to wait too long for it. Um, and the premise is that Louise's parents have died. And they have left behind their house, which is full of her father's academic papers and her mother's doll collection. So she's going to have to head back to Charleston. She's going to have to leave behind her daughter with her ex and deal with their estate. If she wants to sell the house, it's going to need a massive overhaul. And so she's going to need her brother, Mark. And Mark is a man who has never left the city and sort of resents her success um, while he seems to be unable to keep a job. So they are siblings that are kind of estranged, um, having to come together to deal with uh, not only, I suppose, their grief over their parents, but also uh, the very real, I guess, struggles that come with trying to sell a house trying to um sort of upkeep a house and flip it and according to what i've seen it looks like it's going to work with themes of loss and grief of sibling rivalry family dynamics childhood trauma sort of the things that you would expect from a story like this um and as they work through it together they also work through their family's past so they ask questions like why did my parents tape newspaper all over the windows? And, oh no, did that puppet just move? So their parents were killed in a car crash, which is apparently like very obvious from early on. But what is not as obvious is what they were fleeing from because they had left in a hurry. And so these are some of the questions that are going to kind of be answered in this particular Hendrix novel. So, I mean, what are you supposed to do when a house doesn't want to be sold and when puppets that were like the hallmark of your childhood have started to kind of like make a resurgence in your adult life in ways you maybe didn't expect? Um, like I said, if you like horror and comedy, I think this is one to look out for. If you hate puppets, dolls or clowns, maybe not for you. Um, it sounds like it's going to be very tense for a lot of the book with some more like gore and sort of ramping up towards the end. Um and the creepiest thing of all might be why the house is actually haunted. So that's How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix coming soon to a library near you. So my next anticipated novel for 2023 is the debut novel Camp Zero by Michelle Min Sterling, set to come out in early April. So this novel is a intricate dystopian world that isn't too far from our own. So capitalism has left the majority of people vastly unprepared for the realities of climate change, which again, we're not straying too far from the real world right now, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and the wealthy continue to live um, sort of their, their lives of luxury in floating cities. Um, and the rest of us kind of have to live on the ground. And somehow, with all of the uh with all of the changes that the world is going through in this not quite post apocalyptic but definitely getting there world um the north so very northern canada has actually become the most stable place to live rose a korean american sex worker is the one of the main characters and she feels that working in one of the elite clubs uh for the wealthy might be the best hope for her future she wants to give her mother a better life, and she thinks that this is one of the ways that she's going to find stable employment. But to make this happen, she's actually asked to spy on the people up north. Now, up north are two very important places. One place is Camp Zero, 
which was built on the site of a former oil town. It has fresh air. It's got cooler temperatures. It seems like a little bit of a utopia as far as cities on the ground go until the supplies begin to run low. Rose travels to Camp Zero at the same time as Grant, who's a college professor who's trying to flee his family's history. As she spies on um, Camp Zero and in particular the architect at Grand Zero, or sorry, at Camp Zero, they discover a mystery. The other place up north is a hidden military base, a leftover research station from the Cold War era that is run by highly trained women soldiers. The code name is White Alice, and their mission is climate surveillance. So that's really all we know so much so far about the plot. It's definitely um, what I could find was more about the places in this world as opposed to anything about what the mystery is going to be like, which maybe makes sense because it's a mystery, um, or even the sort of journeys that the characters go on. But it seems like it's got a lot of sci-fi and action elements, but there's also a bit of a thriller aspect with the mystery because it kind of poses some dangers to the characters. Um, the stuff that I had seen sort of compares it to Station Eleven by Emily uh, St. John Mandel. So if that's your thing, you might want to look for Camp Zero by Michelle Min Sterling. So my next book is set to release at the end of February. This is Sync by Joseph Earl Thomas. And it's a half fictionalized memoir. So it's half fictionalized because only some of the characters are real and some are fictional. It's also written in the third person, which is sort of odd for a memoir. I feel like you could pick it up and not realize that it's a memoir at all. Um, so Joseph Earl Thomas is also a poet. He writes on a variety of topics, including video games, black studies, uh, sci-fi, and fantasy. So he's got a lot of different um, interests that you can really see come out in this memoir. And um, this one is a particularly dark book. So be prepared if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Joey, the main character, is a stand-in for Thomas. And he has a story that, while it's maybe incredibly depressing to read about, I think it's still an important one. The story is told in vignettes that span from when Joey's around eight to about 13. So uh, technically a brief period of time, but obviously a very foundational one. And it's a cruel reality that he lives. His mother struggles with addiction and uses in front of her children with strange and unsavory men. His house seems to be covered in cockroaches that get in everything from his cereal to his sister's ear. He's hungry all the time. He's bullied mercilessly at school for not being masculine enough or for not being black enough. Instead of trying to fit in, he turns instead to video games and anime and sci-fi and all of these fantasy worlds that we use to escape. Because he can create his own narrative there, he has some element of choice, some element of power. He can be what he wants to be, and he can be the one that inflicts the violence instead of suffering it. So when I say that some of the characters are real in this, I mean that his mother and grandparents are real. They're very grounded in reality. When I say that some of the characters are fake, I mean that a fairly prevalent force is Goku from De Dragon Ball Z. And so he's here, you know, representing um, the depiction of masculinity and agency that Joey wishes he could embody. So... In a story like this, Goku is just as important as his grandparents are. It does look to be an incredibly tough read, but important one about how it can feel to create a community and a path for yourself based on your interests and not just the life you were born into. So I think that Sync by jo Joseph Earl Thomas is going to be a really good one, a really interesting one, uh, maybe a hard one. But as mentioned, he's also he's also a poet. And so I feel like at least the writing style might be very very engaging even at the times when it might be um yeah it might be a little bit much so take this one at your own pace figure out whether or not it's right for you but it is coming out at the end of february so also coming out in late february we have wolfish wolf self and the stories we tell about fear by erica berry so as it sounds this one is nonfiction. And it's about the cultural legacy of this idea of the wolf and what it means in both a literal sense and in a symbolic sense. 
I personally enjoy this sort of like holistic deep dive that considers psychology and history and like cultural context, linguistics. Um, it seems like that's what this is going to be. I've seen some other uh, nonfictions that are kind of similar to this. One of the ones that I talked about in one of our earlier upcoming books was Death by Landscape, which is sort of similar, um, just in the sense of it takes from a wide variety of different sources to create a nonfiction that's about a specific topic. So not the same topic at all, but the same kind of thing. Um, Wolfish, it seems like it's going to discuss everything from xenophobia to feminism to the environment and how it plays into our understanding of predator and prey. It's following in part the journey of OR7. So OR7 was a tagged wolf that left his pack in Oregon. And it goes alongside Barry as she herself leaves Oregon and sort of understanding the self as well as pack dynamics, as well as just the world that we live in um, through some of the, the same lenses and using some of the um, some of the ways that she's experienced certain things in her life and comparing them to the way that essentially wolves act. So some of the questions that arise are questions of the binary between wild and domestic um, that you might see emerge from sheep farms and wolf sanctuaries, questions of belonging as wolves cross man-made country borders, and 17th century bodily sores that might be referred to as wolves. So all of these are different aspects of the same topic that really come from a variety of different places, but kind of weave together to make an interesting, not quite a narrative, because of course it's a nonfiction, but um, an interesting think piece, I suppose. So it borrows aspects from criticism, journalism, memoir. Um, I think it's important when these sort of nebulous types of nonfiction ground themselves in that biased perspective of the author, uh, which it seems like Erica Berry is going to do. So I think it will be interesting and it would be a good match for anyone who is a fan of H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald or Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law by Mary Roach. So uh, the Fuzz may be more in terms of the actual, the practical ways in which the two um have some topics that overlap because there's definitely a discussion of legalities. Um, wolves really can't be illegal when they're crossing borders and things like that. But, you know, the wolves are breaking the law anyway. So if you if that sounds at all interesting, keep a lookout for Wolfish, Wolf Self, and the Stories We Tell About Fear by Erica Berry. So coming in early January, we have The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. I think out of all the books that I'm recommending, this is the one that is the least like something I would normally read, but it does sound interesting uh, for some particular reasons. So in 2022, uh, Rachel Hawkins released Reckless Girls, and in 2021, she put out The Wife Upstairs. So it seems like she's been slowly moving away from paranormal romance and into the land of thrillers. So the villa is described as gothic suspense, and it takes inspiration from Fleetwood Mac, the Charles Manson murders, and the reason that I chose this book, the summer that Percy and Mary Shelley spent with Lord Byron in a castle, creating drama, and also Frankenstein. So it's a girl's trip to Italy for Emily and Chess, who hope to refresh their childhood friendship. Where better to stay than a gorgeous Italian villa? It even has an interesting past. Back in the 70s, a famous rock star invited a budding musician his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's stepsister to join them. The girlfriend started writing one of the greatest horror novels of all time. The stepsister composed a platinum album, and the budding musician was murdered. Emily starts to dig into the villa's history and realizes that there actually might be more to it than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But it's not only distant history that's being uncovered. Her own relationship with her friend become strained will the villa see another death this summer so there's the two stories in this one there's uh 
one being that expanded take on uh, the rock stars who were there and the other one being the modern author and her Instagram influencer friend, which I can see why they'd slowly turn on each other. Um, it seems like the relationship will really be the drama here in both stories. Uh, if you like thriller or history, you might want to pick up The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. So for me, I know it's mostly the history. I'm more interested in that rock star story from the past. I want to see... I want to see the perceived Mary Shelley of it all. So the Villa by Rachel Hawkins. All right. Thank you, Gabriel. That's a great variety of books that you have. You even got me interested in the memoir, which I don't usually read. But I think like you said, it's a very interesting one when you do it like third person, you know, kind of a person per, per person kind of point of view. And also, of course, you know, like all the references to, you know, the 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 fantasy world that they created for themselves. Um and and Goku, I mean, <laughs> I need, need to read that. And then like of course, you know, I'm gonna read the Grady Hendrix book. But like when I I've ne- I didn't actually read anything about the book. So until now I didn't actually know what the book is about. But like when I heard the title, I just imagining this real estate agency that that's what they specialize in is they sell haunted houses. Like, I think that would be a, a fun book. I would read a book about real estate agency if that's what they do. Yeah. So, yeah. So thank you for all of that. And um, I hope listeners, you will pick up one of the suggestions from the five of us or one or more of the suggestions, I should say, um, because there are many, many more books coming out and we look forward to reading with you all of you in the new year so thank you for listening and we will see you next week bye, bye.